Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another special edition of the show. So I'm at my first appointment for uh, this Oregon trip. I'm at Willamette Valley Vineyards, um, and I'm hanging out with Julie Harris, uh, brand manager, no, brand, so, wait, associate brand ambassador. Yes. <laughs> you got so, it. <laughs> so I looked, I looked at the email real quick. Yeah. What's her title again? Um, it's a mouthful. So uh, um, I know every time I... Go in front of a window, the sun comes out, or something stupid happens, but the sun's over there, so we should be good. It's a, We should be a little bit better exposed, but I think I've got a happy medium between where you can see the clouds and all that. I just wanted the view. It's a super cool view. So uh, Julie and I have been hanging out for the past like two-ish hours or whatever, yeah, uh, going through the vineyards, going through the winery. Um, I have to first of all say she's such a trooper because um, I have a hoodie, and she was dressed like this. Just like this. And it's in the 50s. It's like 52 or 55 degrees, 57 on my watch. And it's windy. And she was out there for almost an hour, no. like on and off with me. It's not and she Texas was just weather. like, she's like, it's fine. <laughs> so um, we got some cool drone footage, but we're kind of getting ahead of things. So let's get started. Julie, let's um, kind of introduce yourself. How did you get to here? What brought you from Texas? Mm -hmm. Yeah, see? Yeah, Texas. Texas people, folks. To, to hear, right? <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much, Mark, again, for having me. Um, yeah. Really, this all started for me when I was young uh, in okay. my grandparents' kitchen. My grandparents, John and Ann, were just huge entertainers and just amazing cooks. So I really fell in love with kind of the culinary and food side of things. And okay. they were always really into wine. And they were the ones that gave me my first sip of wine. And that evolved over the years. And I, I kind of fell off from it. I got my undergraduate in an apparel and textile design and did some wine drinking. I had wine as a passion on the side, but never really made a career out of it until I moved to Oregon. Okay. Uh, my husband brought us here mm -hmm. about eight years ago. And I was I was in a job that it, it wasn't really speaking to my heart. It wasn't what I knew that I was supposed to be okay. doing. And then um, two years ago, this opportunity came up to be the brand ambassador here at Willamette Valley Vineyards. And just the way that their values lined up with what I was looking for, it made so much sense. And it was a company I was really proud to kind of be asked to be a part of. And okay. the rest is history. It's been two years now and it's, you know, still, still having fun. Nice. <laughs> nice. So, um, we never mentioned where I work, which I already told her that, but, yes. um, so I met Julie, she was doing some tasting in the market. And, um, so this is how we kind of got together. Um, plus, uh, I also had ran into who was the gentleman? I ran Ryan into? Clifford. Ryan, yeah, yeah, Ryan over at Texom. Mm -hmm. So that was my first contact with with uh, with the vineyard. And then she showed up. I was like, Hey, I'm going to come out. So she's been really instrumental in getting everything set up for me. So again, thank you so much. Of course, it's um, fun having Texans out here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I'm from Jersey, but I did grow up in Texas. Yeah. Um, and actually, she, she's a fellow Italian, which I didn't realize that yeah, we were doing Marino the- Yeah, is my maiden name. <laughs> yeah, which we were talking, we were, you know, she knew I was Italian, yeah. she saw the name. Yeah. <laughs> but when we were doing the tour, you mentioned an Italian family, I was like, oh wow, that's cool. So anyway, um, so let's talk about uh, the history of the winery. Yeah. Uh, this is a uh, really cool story. So let's kind of go back to, well actually, maybe the pre-beginning, right? The beginning, yeah. So yeah. it, I mean, it starts the guy, Jim Berno, he was really the one that made it happen. Mm -hmm. but. It goes back a little bit further than yeah. 1983 from when he purchased this first 15 acres out here. We can take a look all the way back to 1959 when Richard Sommer uh, came out to just outside of Roseburg and founded Hillcrest Winery. And okay. he needed an attorney to help navigate a lot of the licensing laws. He wanted to be able to sell his wine. Um, and as you know, Hillcrest was the first bonded winery in Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, and he was introduced to Jim's father, Fred. And from there, they just formed 
formed this amazing partnership together. And so Jim growing up would have these amazing bottles of wine, like that he'd be able to taste little sips of there yeah. here and then. And he just really got inspired at that point in time of just like what you can do with just a little bit of grapes and yeast and fermentation. In fact, him and his brothers at the age of 10 and 12, they got into a little bit of mischief and wanted to see if they could make their own wine. So they got those old, you know, glass milk jugs and mm -hmm. their mom had some grape concentrate in the freezer and just packets of yeast and brought out their analog Wikipedias, encyclopedias. Right. And they made wine with just that. And I guess they for had forgotten about it for a little bit and uh, they eventually came across it again and Jim tasted it and he was pretty impressed with what he tasted. Of course, it's like a 10 year old <laughs> yeah. though. Right, so yeah. <laughs> I, I imagine that what we're about to drink now is probably yeah, a little better. better. Yeah. <laughs> so basically what he did with what they did during Prohibition. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so to catch you up on the story, so during Prohibition, they would the 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 wineries that stayed in business would basically make great, great concentrate, mm -hmm. like bricks of grapes. They would have the yeast with it, and they would have instructions what not to do. Yeah, as long as they to did. tell you how to do it. So, <laughs> and and you could make your own wine at home, which was legal. Make your own wine, something like that. Anyway, yeah. So yeah, so that's what they did basically. Yeah. You couldn't yeah. sell finished wine unless you were selling to the church or something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, that's cool. And so that was his first like chance at winemaking. But it, it, from there, you know, it, it took him away from it. He studied law for a while and then he kind of circled back around and wanted to do it more full time. And so he uh, found just a, a mere 15 acres yeah. in South Salem. Um, it was a plot of land that had been an old, old plum orchard and it had been completely overrun with blackberry brambles. So he had a, a lot of work on his hands mm -hmm. there. In fact, I guess some of the neighbors were even like selling he was completely crazy for wanting to try and convert this to right. a vineyard site because this was 1983. This was a time not a lot of people were even doing vineyards. So mm -hmm. this was a big deal. Uh, but he he's very determined. He knew this was going to happen and knew, he knew the result of it was going to be world-class Pinot Noir. So he started off, he just had the 15 acres that he planted. Uh, he actually... Um, borrowed a tractor from David Lett uh, to help clear some of the the orchard out. And he used a Christmas tree planter just from across okay. the road to plant all the vines in. And in fact, um, some of our first uh, rootstocks were actually from uh, Sokol Blosser. So okay. it's the story of Oregon is it's always been a story about people kind of coming together and helping each other right. out. It's it's not really competitive. It's more like a friendly, like collaborative competition because we're everyone's so excited to mm -hmm. to taste each other's wines and everyone wants to drink good wine. So it's it's always been a, a fun kind of spirited ri friendly rivalry out here. And I think that another thing that drew Jim to to wanting to see this out and you yeah. know here we are we have over 400 acres now of all of our estate grown property all of it's sustainably farmed mm -hmm. live certified low impact viticulture and analogy and salmon safe as well so nothing we're putting into the ground is running off into this wonderful salmon population we right. have in the pacific northwest nice um just because i'm not going there um for the for the viewers can you describe who david light is yes um he he was pretty much one of the, the, OG, guy. One of the one of the OGs, yeah, <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yeah. Um, the OGs, he started... Um Irie. Irie, yes. yes. Sorry. <laughs> I know. Don't, don't sometimes there. sometimes we get sometimes we get brain farts too, but <laughs> thank you. Um I knew it was Irie, but I, 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 I don't I, film that part. <laughs> no, um, but yeah, so unfortunately I'm not gonna make the Irie. I might maybe I'll go to the tasting room, but I, I yeah. don't have like an official visit or or stuff. Um so yeah, I mean this is obviously the first um this is the first ep the first uh, episode, the first um appointment I have. And I'm seeing a lot of like I would say rock stars, original mm -hmm. OGs, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I've seen a couple smaller ones, but, um, you know, I tried to get the core four. I didn't get all of them. I got a couple of them, but, um, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll try to like stop by some tasting rooms, um, because I should have a little bit of time in my afternoons. Yeah. Uh, all my morning appointments are interviews. The only other interview I have this an afternoon that's for sure is, is, E Rath. I can't always say it Rath. It's E Rath, right? You could say it either way. I okay. Like. Um, <laughs> as long as you say it, yeah. Willamette and not Willamette. <laughs> it's Willamette, damn it. Uh, do I have to put the explicit tag on now? Oh, so, uh, um, son of a. <laughs> yeah, right. But uh, uh, yeah, so just wanted to, to give him a little bit of a shout out because, you know, without 
kind of him and a couple yeah. other people. This we whole would, yeah, wouldn't this be would a thing. Be yeah. All right. So let's fast forward to uh, 83, right? 83. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So Jim, little Jim Bruno from small town of Roseburg, Oregon, middle class family. You know, he had this these big ambitions to do this, but obviously not a lot of the money to do it. So mm -hmm. he had a brilliant idea. Uh, he gathered a community of wine enthusiasts together and worked with the government to create pretty much the first public offering in the United States and the first, first crowdfunded winery right. ever too. So we had a hundred original founders and these people were just like salt of the earth. They invented or they invested their, their time um, as well as their money, but they were out in the harvest working. They were in our tasting room, just bottling wine, the whole nine yards, just yeah. kind of working on just the fact that this is such a cool endeavor that they were going to be a part of a part of history almost. And I, yeah. now we're still publicly traded. Mm -hmm. um, we're on NASDAQ. WVVI is our stock uh, number, initials number, number. Ticker. Ticker. Ticker something. Yeah. Ticker number, ticker. I don't know. Symbol. <laughs> so many brain Symbol. Parts. Symbol. Symbol. <laughs> yeah. like Symbol. That sounds better. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we have over 6,000 shareholders in the United States now. And it's, I get to travel, you know, across the country and I'll run into shareholders in Iowa and they'll yeah. be like, we invested in your company in 1993. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's, that's so exciting that you yeah. guys are, are that excited about us. Um, and you're, completely opposite sides of the country it's it's amazing that's that's cool like I, it's pretty much pretty much unique or pretty it rare is, I, it's, I don't think i've seen that ever anywhere else happen yeah, yeah. i don't know if really too many i'm sure they exist i'm sure there's yeah. probably a larger i'm sure there's probably a large or like it might be like a wine might be part of a really 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 large conglomerate that's publicly traded but yeah <laughs> but this is like power the yeah people. yeah <laughs> um so yeah, and, and you actually have uh, uh, where, I, where I parked, where the tasting room parking is. There's like a, I, I hopefully I'll take a picture of it mm -hmm. when I go out. Um, there's like vines at the first hundred, right? Yeah, yeah. We have our founders block, which is yeah. right out there, and each one of those vines represents the original hundred investors yeah. in our company. And you can go up there; they have the people's name plates like right on them too. Yeah. So really great, great way to pay homage to them. Cool. So um, uh, so we started. Well, we met in the tasting room, and it was still like so. It's like going to a restaurant before they're open. Mm -hmm. So everything, you know, is not exactly all where it should be. I don't have any pictures of that. I'll take pictures after because the taste room is gorgeous. Like we're – so we started there and then um, we came down to this area. So this is the library, right? Right. Mm -hmm. right this so is Jim's private li wine yeah. library. So he keeps all of the older vintages here, wine from some of his friends from the other vineyards in Oregon. Um, mm -hmm. It's just a nice, quiet place with a great view. <laughs> yeah, it's a great view. Um, you know, so the tasting room opens at 11, which is, you know, about a half hour ago. Mm -hmm. So I try to be in areas that won't be accessible to the public, or at least I don't have people behind, like, and all yeah. that. But um, so it's a nice, quiet area. The view is amazing. Um, there's another room over there, uh, another amazing view, but I kind of like the this, this view is a little bit better. Um, we got all these other wines around here. And so we kind of checked this out. I dropped off my stuff. And then we kind of headed outside yeah. a little bit. So we roughed it. Yeah, we went. Um, <laughs> where did we go first? We went. We didn't. Um, we kind of went to. We looked at the crush tent. Looked at the cr yeah, the, the where, yeah the crush tent uh, and, the, and the crush pad area. So mm -hmm. we kind of looked at that. So you have uh, it's, it's basically outside. Yeah. And we talked about. Um, that the climate here isn't really that bad this time of year. So no, yeah. and it's, I mean, typically it's going to be very mild out mm -hmm. here. You know, in the winter, it doesn't get below 40 very often. Um, and then in the fall, you know, this time of year is when it really starts to get rainy, but we get some of the most beautiful summers out here. Yeah. It really makes me forget like the nine months out of the year that it's actually rainy. <laughs> um, but it's perfect for growing cool weather varietals like Pinot mm -hmm. Noir and Pinot Gris and also Chardonnay, which I'm really yeah. excited that we're able to kind of finally make some amazing Chardonnay yeah. out here. Nice. And you have like this, you have you, a somewhat new, like a, the, was a 30 some odd thousand gallon tank. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And you That's, have like kind of car, which, you know, I, I, I did take a picture, but I didn't get a picture of the actual soil. I, we'll see if I can do that. Yeah. But yeah, you had to like, you carved out a little bit, but you left it like there, right? We left the cross section of the soil yeah. there to fit in these tanks. Um, and you just see this, if you do, can get a picture to show it, it's, it's gorgeous because it is this gorgeous 
deep red, rich volcanic material. Um, it's what we call jory soil, mm -hmm. which happens to be Oregon state soil. So if you're ever doing a trivia night and Oregon yeah. state soil is a question, you'll know. <laughs> so now, like, it's Oregon state soil. Like, uh, jory, I know that. And no one was like, what? what? <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll try to stump, st stump a master song. I can't do the Larry Stone because he lives out here. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm I, I, I hopefully will be visiting them, but um, yeah. So we did that, and then um, we went back over to the uh, to the tent, and so this was kind of cool. So you had you had the the fermenters, and mm -hmm. you had some of the stuff was covered, some of it wasn't, mm -hmm. and they were doing punch downs. Um, and so I got to like taste. So I tasted a Pinot grape, and then I tasted the Cap Franc. Cap right? Franc, yeah. That's right. We did Cap that Franc. Was, that was cool. <laughs> Um, so kind of talk about the sources that you get all your grapes from. You have several vineyards that you work with or you own, right? Yeah. So, uh, for our Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, those varietals, we are primarily a state grown. Uh, we have plans to be a hundred percent estate grown by the year 2022. So mm -hmm. we're almost there, uh, for our wines, like our estate Pinot Noir and our, right. our single vineyard designates. Those are all estate grown. Uh, we have three main properties that we are able to manage and make okay. sure it is all sustainably farmed to our standards. Um, and that is this plot of land right here. We have 60 acres planted here. And then um, back in 97, we were able to merge with Tualatin Estate, uh, mm -hmm. which was Bill Fuller's vineyard that he planted in 72 up in Forest Grove, right underneath the coastal range out there. So we have about uh, 80 acres or so out there. And then in 2003, we were able to merge with Elton Vineyards, which was started by uh, Dick and Betty O'Brien. They were mm -hmm. kind of locals in Salem, and Betty was with the Girl Scouts of America, and Dick was a school teacher. And uh, through a trip in Germany one one summer, they had just really been inspired by the wine country out there. So they kind of came back and converted slowly but surely Betty's parents' farmland into a vineyard site. Okay. Um, and so we merged with them in 2003, and that's over in the Ola Amity Hills area. Yeah, there's a little over 100 acres out there, um, and we've got some prod fun projects that we're doing um, just all over Oregon. We just planted in Dundee Hills. Okay, uh, that's going to be the home of our Bernoa Estate, where we'll be making our spark, making and growing our sparkling wine program from. It'll be right. completely biodynamic out there. It's going to be amazing. Wine caves, little tasting cabanas. Cool. So excited for that. And uh, then in the Southern Oregon, we work with Quail Run Vineyard out there. Um, we have a few blocks of, of vines out there that we're able to source for our, our uh, Griffin Creek label. So we do Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah, Merlot, Malbec, Grenache list goes on for yeah. those warm climate varietals down mm -hmm. in Southern Oregon in the Rogue Valley. And then we're doing some stuff up in Walla Walla too, in the, the Oregon side. Oregon side, bit. yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of fun to see just how, how much we can grow and, and do with just the state and using our own backyards. Right. Yeah. So that's, so the Cap Franc is, I got, that was from yeah, the Walla Walla, was, yeah. Walla, Walla mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, so this is actually the first time I, I actually took some notes ahead of time. <laughs> I, I usually just, I mean, apologies to anyone I've interviewed in the past. I kind of wing it. I just let them talk. But there was a couple of things I wanted to double. I wanted to like um, make sure I brought up, and nothing, nothing weird. But I'm know. just, I'm just trying to uh, make sure it doesn't lock on me. <laughs> so, I, so I just have it because it was. It's all from the website. It's not like anything weird. I think we've actually covered. I think we've actually covered all this. Oh, there was some stuff. Um, so you guys do a lot of, I know we didn't talk about it, but a lot of community involvement stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you want to highlight a few things that you guys do? Because basically these guys here do a whole bunch of cool stuff. And um, I mean, I knew some of it before I came out mm -hmm. here, but you know, I, once I got out here, I was like, I probably should look up some more yeah. stuff. So I kind of a little more intelligent about things. <laughs> um, so yeah, you, you have a lot of stuff that you actually do. Right? Yeah. yeah. So one of my favorites right off the bat is probably our program that we do with the Raptor Rehabilitation Program out in Southern in, uh, cool. Eugene. Yeah. Um, it's a nonprofit that rescues hawks, owls, and kestrels. And we've actually built these huge birdhouses on our property on some of the tree lines down there, if you take a look at it. Um, and we'll do several releases in, uh, throughout the year. Uh, so when these birds of prey are ready to kind of be back on their wing again, mm -hmm. they'll release them out here. So they'll have really easy buffet ahead of them yeah. and it solves our problem. So we don't have to do anything we, ourselves inhumanely. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, that helps you with, you know, staying within a, a biodynamic or yeah. sustainable type mm -hmm. of thing. So you don't have to use as much 
pest control. Yes, uh, yes, yeah. exactly. And we are live certified, so mm -hmm. that helps us to to really kind of make sure we're treating the land right because we want it to be we want to be growing amazing right. fruit for years and years to come. Uh, so that's really important for us. And so the Raptor program is a little bit part of that yeah. as well. Um, on top of that, um, we have uh, we're salmon safe, um, and that was a program that's kind of Jim started with a few of the legislators and a few of the groups around here. So we're not using any any toxic things that are going into the soil to disrupt the salmon mm -hmm. population yeah. or anything like that. Exactly, with the runoff. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've actually talked about almost all this. So there's a couple things where we are going to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. So in the website, and, and this is we're going to go back in time a little bit. Jim was using garden hoses. Yep. <laughs> so that was so that was that was one of the things like I knew there's some cool stuff here. We've actually talked about most of the stuff in here, but yeah, yeah. So he actually there was an ad in like one of the the new, local newspapers for 17 foot lengths of hose at one of the local uh, grocery chains around here, and so uh, he was, took advantage of that and he like went to all of the stores and like bought them out and then like connected them together and it was him and his wife that were just going back and forth watering all the vines i think they might have had some help from like a school field trip too at yeah. some point but <laughs> so that that's being innovative right yeah. there. i mean that's that's doing whatever you have to that's exactly and then you had and we talked with uh, what was the gentleman's name that we we said we saw doing the who's gonna play tetris later blair. Uh, with blair right yeah. <laughs> with the barrels not the tetris um so he was talking about um uh we mentioned you had a winemaker for the day thing. So tell me about that, that little program. Yeah. Cause that was just like a week ago, right? Yeah. That was a cool program. Yeah. We kind of brought that out to a lot of the stores in the area where, um, they had to buy some of our wine and mm -hmm. put their name in to become a, a winemaker for the day. And it's a perfect season to do that because this is when all of the winemaking actions happening. Um, yeah. whoa. Unfortunately, though, we are almost done harvesting everything, so, so I don't know how everything? much they're going to do. Yeah, but I mean, it's still cool. I mean, yeah. there's still like maybe you don't get to do everything, but I mean, there's still good winemaking exactly. stuff that's going to happen. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's a great way for you know the average wine drinker to come in and and see you know how how it's done. Just really get a better appreciation, I think, for what you're drinking when you can come in and just see all the hard work. And all of the decision making that really goes into yeah. this it's it's you know half mad science half art and it's it's cool that the some public people get to come in and yeah and view that even i don't get to see all of that i mean in my business i get to see a lot i get i mean i get to talk with with people the wineries i get to talk to them about the scientific stuff and all this kind of stuff like Julie, Julie showing. So we, we haven't gotten to this part, in the, in the, but we went to the actual winery area. I was like, "So, Julie, you know the size of those, the microns of those filters?" I was like, "No." I'm like, "That's okay." Hold Don't on, let me it. get out my. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> that was only because I just listened to a podcast, uh, Jim Dwayne, who's awesome. You should listen to him if you want to learn about. It's called Inside Winemaking. It's all about winemaking. Mm -hmm. It's more than technical stuff. Uh, he's the winemaker at Brain Fart um, yeah. CV. So, um, and some point in time, he and I were gonna we're gonna hook up. Um, but he had a, somebody from Scott lab, not labs, um, talk about filtration. So that's why it was top of mind to me. It's like, Oh, filters. But, um, but yeah, so basically I get to see a lot of this stuff, but I, but it's usually kind of piecemeal. Yeah. You know, you never get to see it. I don't get to see, I don't get to spend that. like, like the whole time with it, but I can say over the, you know, well, I haven't done the interviews for 10 years, but over the years of doing this podcast, I've seen a lot of that stuff. So. To have somebody just like who's not in the industry yeah. to come out, that is, I think that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we actually, so we did that within the, um, uh, the fermentation tent. Mm -hmm. and we went to the winery itself, saw that, and I got to meet, who did I get to meet? Who did I get to meet? The guy. The guy and the, and the girl, <laughs> right? Yeah. And the woman. Mm -hmm. the, the, the man, the man, the guy and the woman that are now like doing all this stuff. So I met Christine, Christine first. Christine Claire. Yeah, mm -hmm. Christine. She's the wine director. Mm hmm so I got to meet her. So she's going to be the future. Yes, she is stepping into Jim's role once yeah. he retires. Um, not sure when that'll be. I, it's hard for him to step away. He loves doing this yeah. so much, I think. so. <laughs> but she's she's going to be the next in line. And so it, that was cool that we got to run into both of them. Yeah. Um, and Christine, actually, she just, wine enthusiast, named her one of the top 40 under 40. Good. Uh, in the yeah. Last, was it the last issue, the last two issues ago? Yeah. Yeah, very cool. And then a little bit later, Jim was on his way somewhere. So I got to say, like, 
you know, a few sentences mm -hmm. to him, got to meet him. So it's cool to get to meet these people. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so we did that. We saw the barrel room. Um, so I kind of asked you about, uh, kind of it's like for Pinot's, uh, the typical aging you do? Yeah, usually it's going to be about 6 to 15 months, um, usually anywhere from a medium to medium light toast since okay. we do grow such amazing fruit out here. We just want the French oak to kind of be the supporting act to the star of the show, mm -hmm. which is the Pinot Noir. Yeah. And then, uh, see, did we go out to some... After, and then we, we saw Blair, mm -hmm. hung out with him for a minute, mm -hmm. and then we went outside, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, we went out. So we came back here, but we went back outside. So let's let's do some wine and we kinda of can talk sure. about this. We can kinda of talk about the outside stuff. Um so uh, what do we have here first? So first uh, we have the 2017 Estate Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be um, just the best Chardonnay from all three of our properties. So it's a really great expression of Oregon Chardonnay, okay. really. And um, I think I'm done with this. Oh, you also have a tasting room McMin McMinnville, McMinnville too. McMinnville and so at Tualatin Estate as okay, well in cool. Forest Grove. Yeah. And what's, what does this retail for? Uh, this retails for a, about $32. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. All right. So o over the past few months, I've, I've either talked to people or I've I've heard people talk about Chardonnay in Oregon. So, I mean, Oregon, we everyone knows Oregon's Pinot Noir, right? Yeah. But Chardonnay is one of those grapes that, for whatever reason, or well, the, the reason that it didn't really take on like Pinot did, even though it seems like it should because, you know, Similar doing Burgundian kind of, yeah. stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, was it the wrong clones were, were, were planted here? Or well, that's what everyone says. But now we've got some better material. Right. So now we're making, well, mm -hmm. me, I'm not me, but you, yeah. all of you guys here. Are now making some really good quality Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. I've had some. I don't think I've had this one because I know uh, maybe I did have it at Texas. I don't remember. Sometimes you don't remember everything you taste yeah. at these conferences, but. <laughs> and so this is done 10 months in French oak and 28% of its new oak. So it still has that gentle support of the French oak, but you really get that bright, acidic driven Chardonnay. It's super tasty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, it's just enough oak on there. Yeah. You're not you're not over oaking it, and you know, hey, if that's if that's the style that you guys want to do, that's fine. But yeah. you're not doing it, which I, I appreciate. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, you have just enough oak on there. Um, the fruit's coming through really nice. It's easy to drink. Uh, cities there, you said like it's bright. Mm -hmm. um, it's delicious. There's a little bit of um, a little bit of that popcorn thing, so it goes through par partial malolactic. Yeah. So mm -hmm. here's the thing. So we talked about like the episode that came out today. Mm -hmm. So the episode that came out the day we we're recording this, I I remember correctly, I wasn't really a fan of that Chardonnay. This is way better Chardonnay. Okay. Oh <laughs> I'm sweating a, a little bit. <laughs> but that one, that one, and there was another one. Um, the the popcorn was that burnt popcorn, mm -hmm. which is so. Um, characteristic of Chardonnays, and I know it has something to do with the fermentation and all that. I'm not going to get into the technical mm -hmm. of that. Um, but when it's so overwhelming, I just don't enjoy it. This is it's there. It's, it's the there. Fruit, yeah. It's just enough. Mm -hmm. And it's a characteristic. It's like, it's not necessarily a flaw when it's like a lot, but you know, it's not flaws. Like, some people love that though. Some people like yeah. the flaws. Like, I had some natural wine the other mm -hmm. day, and I had my first introduction to what called mouse. I never knew oh. what it was. And it's kind of cheesy. Yeah. Like literally. And I was like, I kind of dig it. Yeah. And some people are kind of like, you're weird. Like my boss said, I was weird. So, um, but, um, but that's, that's the thing. Like some, you know, some person's fault is some person's treasure, right? Exactly. And burnt popcorn or popcorn is not a fault by any means of Chardonnay. It's yeah. a characteristic, but, um, this has, it's not overwhelming. It's just enough. It's, it's there. You know, the corn aspect. I like that mm -hmm. in, in Chardonnay, but yeah, that wine. Yeah. So, and that's so kind of the fun part yeah. about wine is that everyone has different unique palettes. Yes. So everyone's going to have something that's, you know, their, their treasure, their favorite. So. Yeah. Just, you know, if we kind of talked about this before, uh, uh, in, in the cellar, like, you know, if I don't like the wine, I'm at least going to find something good about it. Like, yeah. it's just not my style. I like this style, yeah. you know, um, wow. is it, is it the, the, the Chablis style? This is it like my absolute favorite Chardonnay. No, but I like the style also. Yeah. You know, I drink most Chardonnays. I like most Chardonnays, but I like certain Chardonnays. This is totally, totally in my wheelhouse of what I would, I would buy for myself and mm -hmm. drink. Mm -hmm. So 
if there's you need an endorsement, that's your endorsement right there. I yeah. would totally buy this. So, <laughs> yeah. And this this is going to be great when you're upstairs having lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an amazing clams dish with a pesto broth that's amazing pairing with the Chardonnay too. You get a lot of that the nice like kind of butteriness from the Chardonnay yeah. with like the garlic and the the greenness from the broth. It's a beautiful pairing. I don't think it's <laughs> oh shoot! <laughs> Don't get that. Thing. No, that's okay. So th that um, so so my, the people I'm staying with, my uh -huh. hosts. Um, so Sunday, yesterday, they said, "Hey, you want to come up and watch some football?" Uh, which is cool because I had just watched the first morning game. My yeah. Vikings won. Yeah, I know I'm, I live in Texas, but I, I'm a Vikings <laughs> fan. And actually, I hate Dallas, but oh, the Alex, Cowboys. You should <clears> say that in front of me. <laughs> sorry. Anyway, so um. So I went upstairs and watched uh, the Seahawk game mm -hmm. with them, but some of their neighbors brought this this uh, food, and they're like, yeah, we have some clam chowder. I was like, oh, oh yeah, it's about that. <laughs> I already had lunch. That was good, but I was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a seafood fan. It sucks because that's an entire category of food that yeah. wine can go so well with. Uh, and I've had I've had some seafood since I started this podcast, mm -hmm. uh, and paired with wine. It's, so to understand why it works, but yeah, I just still yeah. not a fan of it. But that's okay. Uh, but yes, yeah, so but I'm looking forward to after this. I'm going to have some lunch, which is great because I don't have to go find a place for lunch. Take that travel time, go there, and I can spend a little more time here until I go to my next appointment. Yeah. So But yeah, the the, the chardonnay is really nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I don't know uh, if so, I can say thank you. I didn't actually make it, but oh, you're still involved in it, right? Yeah. <laughs> You're, you're you're the face of the winery, yes, right? Yes, so, true. There you go. Um, so we've got this rosé. So while you're pouring that, yes. So we did some footage of. So I took some footage of kind of from the back area where you see the crush pad area, and uh, you can really was more so you can see this view also from from the air. And then we went down, and this is where she was such a trooper because it was getting windy. My and it's actually, I think it's actually too windy right now for me to fly the drone. So I, it was perfect time. Yeah. Okay. So then we went a little bit farther, not over here, but. That way, so I could get hopefully cue the cool beauty shot of the winery as I come up the hill, and um, so that was a lot of fun. I got did like basically two takes of that. So yeah. whichever take worked out, yeah, I'm excited to see those. So um, and this is why I got the drone so I can take footage so you guys can watch cool drone footage, and uh, so that's I'm excited about doing that. And because I just tasted some wine, I cannot fly the drone the rest of the day. Oh darn! So yeah, that's the FAA for you. I'm glad you came here first. Hey, you know what? That that's actually every pilot, commercial like airline pilot, yeah. or if you have a taste of alcohol within eight hours of flying, you can't fly. So it's really for your safety. Yeah. So that's fine. <laughs> no one wants a drone flying through their window either. Or a seven forty seven. Yeah. <laughs> True. So let's uh, let's talk about yeah. this rosé. Yeah. So it's a 2018 whole cluster rosé of Pinot Noir. Okay. It has about less than 24 hours worth of skin contact, and it comes from the very first run of juices from our whole cluster Pinot Noir that we've been making since like the mid 90s forever. It's the one that people are just so excited about and mm -hmm. try and seek out everywhere. But um, it's old world style of winemaking. When we do the whole cluster Pinot Noir, we're just hand harvesting the grape cluster still intact. And they're gently tossed into the stainless steel tanks, put the yeast in, seal it up, pump it with CO2. From there, the juice just starts fermenting inside of their own skins and they just swell so much that they burst under the pressure. And just the result um, from that first run of juices, the, the regular Pinot Noir, it's gonna be just that juicy, playful um, Pinot Noir are very fresh young Pinot Noir right. and this carries a lot of that same elements to it only it has a little bit more minerality to it um, obviously it's lighter in color but yeah. you just get that like kind of juicy almost like a, a gumdrop uh, taste but okay. the acidity comes through right before it gets too sweet so it's it's mainly going to be more fruity but still on the dry side so uh, aroma is great on this uh, you know you got a little bit of strawberry watermelon which you know I've, I've had a lot of rosés recently and for some reason I, I haven't been getting the watermelon on it mm -hmm. um, and maybe it's because it's been mostly like old world like yeah. French stuff but um, but you, you can't get you can't get it from those but uh, it's always been like the strawberry uh, that I've been getting but that's really really pleasant uh, on the nose you know, it's great and especially with you know Thanksgiving coming up mm -hmm. I mean I think rosé people are just really you know know it for summertime wine but boy with a turkey get some dry rosé with it it's it's pretty ideal <laughs> yeah you know the phrase rosé all they know it's rosé uh -huh. every day right yep. because 
well, well, hey, in Texas, they drink cab when it's 100 degrees out. So to them, they don't Blows care. My mind. <laughs> um, but I, rose is such a great food pairing wine, also, mm-hmm. um, that you can totally, especially uh, holidays, is a great time to do it because yeah. you have all types of different cool food that you're going to pair it with. But I mean, there's no reason why you can't crush a bottle in no. February watching yeah. the Super Bowl or something. Yeah, like that, right? that's perfect. I mean, <laughs> lower alcohol content. It's yeah. easier to, to do it. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, this is really tastes good. I, I like this one a lot. You know, I, I like rosé as a category. Um, some rosés, you know, are a little bit better for my palate. Mm-hmm. Like I enjoy a little bit better. I mean, I enjoy pretty much any rosé, but um, I like this one. It kind of hits a, a sweet spot. Not that it's sweet, but it kind of hits a yeah. sweet spot of aromas and flavors. Um, it's light enough. It's not super heavy. It's got really great acidity to it. It's really crisp and bright, um, and it's 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 light enough too. So I mean, but you get all the great all the great characteristics of the Pinot, and I think it's yeah, yeah it's just wonderful. Just a kiss of Pinot. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> So I just noticed you have a little, is this your little like where you pour? Absolutely. In, in That's the five room? ounces. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's more not inside baseball, I guess. But so a lot of places, not just wineries, but mm-hmm. like actually my, my favorite wine bar in San Antonio, uh, High Street, they just, they just, they got fancy on theirs. So they have like a logo and they have like a line for the two ounce where ah, they do like flights uh-huh. and they have like the bottom of the logos or I think it's either four or five. Mm-hmm. But, you know, depending on depending on what you're going to be, you're standing working four, five, or six is your standard pour. Yeah. But uh, I've worked in restaurants or I've seen restaurants that do that, and it makes it so much easier. Like if you're doing a by the glass program, yeah, you're so, in a hurry. Or- yeah, so you're not over pouring, and you're also not under pouring, so that mm-hmm. the guest is getting what they're paying for. Mm-hmm. Um, but also helps keep the bartenders honest that they're not like hooking somebody up, mm-hmm. you know. And it can be like, especially glasses like this, and someone goes, it's not full. Like I gave you a full five ounces. Yeah. It's just like it's broad and like it's you know. Trust me, you got your you got your money's worth. <laughs> well, here's another piece of trivia for yeah. you. One of these glasses, which were designed for Oregon Pinot Noir, will hold a full bottle of wine in there. Yes. So a lot a lot of times you see these huge glasses and working. You know, back in my previous life at Morton's, I can talk about that. I don't work there anymore. <laughs> um, so yeah, our our red wine glasses were not quite. Enough mm-hmm. for a full bottle, but it was like darn close. It was like 22, 23 <laughs> ounces full. Um, so uh, 750 is 25.4 ounces. We didn't know what that was. So yeah, like when you get like that big glass and you and only fill it up to about there, you're getting a glass. It's just yeah. you need all that headspace. Perspective, yeah. So, the, the, the reason, the headspace gives you that way to collect all the aromas and all that. So mm-hmm. yeah. So when you go to the fancy restaurant and they give you the big wine glass, oh, I'm talking to you, you know this. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's why you have all that. So cool. Yeah. That's super well, tasty. Yeah. I like that. Hey, so you want to know which one I like better? The rosé or the chardonnay? I like the rosé better. <laughs> well, it's just going to get better than I Yeah, know. probably. <laughs> um, not probably, no. Because uh, So this, oh, so what we got here? So this next one is the 12 Ten Estates of 2016, which is mm-hmm. an amazing vintage for Oregon. Yeah, so, um, just yeah, Everything talk about happened that. at the right time. We had a really kind of mild winter, a um, lot of great rainfall to carry us through for the drier summer months. And mm-hmm. we had a, you know, a pretty easygoing fall. There wasn't any crazy weather events where we had to, like, wait to harvest. We could harvest right when the grapes were at their peak ripeness or right when we they were at the right levels for picking. Yeah. Um, and so it just resulted in just uh, spectacular. All the wines from that year I've had have just been gangbusters amazing. So Unlike maybe like this year where it was a little more challenging? It was definitely challenging yeah. this year, but it's still going to create very unique wines that are going to be still amazing and delicious, and yeah. it'll tell the story of this year. Um, so it's kind of fun about wine. Every year it's, it's a different story. It's a historical marker as to yeah. what's going on. It doesn't mean it's worse or better, but there are just some that the winemakers prefer because it was easier on the Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> and this area, you have more vintage variation than, say, other areas yeah. that are fairly consistent from year to year to year. That's why they the wines may pretty much taste the same from every – not that it's bad. Just, no. They just taste – No. There's a similarity uh, from year to year. Yeah. yeah. So um, – and we were talking about this um, 
this year was a little bit closer to what it used to be, maybe 10 ish, yeah, 10, 15 yeah, years ago. Yeah, just constant rain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> little cooler. Mm-hmm. Um, but past three years, you know, we've had some really high spikes in temperatures, and we didn't really right. have that this summer. Uh, we had a l- little bit more rain over the summer where yeah. we would normally have all the sunshine and kind of l- allow the fruits to really blossom and grow. Um, and we had a, l- a little bit more rain this harvest. So it kind of created, I think, some. Um, non-uniformity within the grape sizes. So that's going to be really interesting and and kind of making sure that the texture and flavors are the same concentration that the winemakers are wanting. Yeah, and hence why me showing up this time was not the best. Well, it's it's, it's perspective. Is this also sometimes the best time for me to show up or just anyone to show up because harvest is going on and there's a lot of activity in the winery? It also could be, you know, she's able to give me the time, um, but a lot of times the winery doesn't have anyone that can give me two, three hours to yeah, spend. Yeah, usually all hands on deck. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but like this year, harvest went pretty late, mm-hmm. at least not oh, versus him the past some, Yeah, some we just years. brought in our, our final uh, load, I guess, today, yeah. today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I do, t- again, I appreciate the fact that, and she's heard me say it probably 5,000 times already. Okay. You can say it 5,000 times. But, 5, um, you know, everybody who's seeing me during my during my trip because it is harvest uh, or even it's just even if it's only the tail end there's still activity going on that someone's going to have to spend time with me yeah. especially the interviews the the tasting appointments usually are like short yeah but, um, but yeah so let's so yeah so this is um, Twalton Estate 2016 16, yeah single vineyard designate so these vines out here planted in 1972 by Bill Fuller uh, he was a winemaker at Louis Martini for years and mm-hmm. discovered that. Doing wine making up in Oregon was the thing that he wanted to pursue. So he came out here and planted up in uh, Forest Grove, right underneath the coastal range out there. Um, so we got old vines out there. It's it's one of our driest vineyard sites, and it also sees the biggest temp- temperature variation. So it'll be really chilly at night, but it could be blazing hot during the day. Okay. So really unique soil or temperature and soil. Mm-hmm. There's glacial rock material out really? there. Okay. There's piezolite. So it's it's fun being out there. And we have a tasting room out there as well. And mm-hmm. when you go out there, it, it just, it feels like you're on a ranch pretty right. much. And people bring their dogs and just picnic out there. It's a really delightful place. Um, and we were able to merge with Tualatin Estate in 97. And that was really Jim's first big break. He'd always wanted to buy grapes from uh, Bill. And finally, Bill gave him a call in 97. He was like, okay, Jim, here's the deal. I'll give you these grapes, but uh, you're going to have to take this leaking barn and this rusty tractor too. And that's when uh, talks began to, to merge our companies together. Bill wanted to retire. And so that added 80 more acres to our property. It was huge. Just one more step in becoming mm-hmm. 100% estate grown. So on this, again, aromatically in, in the palette, this is really, I would call this superior, honestly. Um, it's just got some really smooth, uh, it's really smooth. The the wine making is really excellent. Um, the oak isn't over the top. No. Um, you know it, it's so. Here's the thing. I, and I don't know if I said this when you when you visited San Antonio. Um, this is kind of why Oregon's expression as a whole of Pinot Noir is my favorite. Um, no no disrespect to Burgundy. I mean, I went to Burgundy. I finally get it now. <laughs> Whereas I didn't. I was kind of like, oh, gosh, it's Pinot Noir or whatever. Um, I was like, yeah, but I like Oregon Pinot Noir, so it can't be that bad, yeah. right? Um, so between California and Burgundy, Oregon physically and stylistically is kind of in between, though way close to California. But um, you still have a brightness of fruit. Yeah. Um, and you can still get some earthy or mineral characteristics, whereas Burgundy – is more earth driven, which is kind of funny because I actually prefer earth driven mm-hmm. wines as a whole. I prefer old world wines oh, yeah. over new world, but man, I tell you just like the Halloween episode, which has already been out, which, um, so I, I reviewed a California cab mm-hmm. and it was juicy and big yes. and tons of stupid Oak in there. <laughs> and you know what? It was delicious. <laughs> and so every, Every wine is there, and I, I like. It's like your kids. You you don't have a favorite, 
supposedly, but you appreciate what they have, what they have. So with, uh, with this, um, you got that good marriage of old and new world. Mm -hmm. Um, it's slightly more on the new world side, which is kind of my preference with Pinot. Um, so, but yeah, I think, you know, uh, you guys are doing an excellent job with this, um, really bringing out Oregon and what it can do, uh, with Pinot. I mean, it's just, you know, there's, there's like this kind of chocolate covered cherry. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's not like a lot of chocolate. Um, it's a cherry, but it's, it's not a dried cherry. It's, it's kind of fresh. Um, so. It reminds me of like a Rainier cherry almost with like a little baking spice undertone. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's almost like, it's almost like a touch of a real maraschino cherry, not Mm -hmm. to look fake bright red ones, but the, like the Luxardo type thing, but it's not so rich. It's just like, just a kiss. Yeah, just yeah, just just a little bit. It's not like really over the top like California Pinot mm-hmm. that has the. You know. Anyway, mm-hmm. um, I'm not going to disparage anybody because some people really like that style. <laughs> I just don't. And on the palate, you get more of the spices. Yeah. Um, it's really integrating the fruit. It's it's almost like it's almost like a little bit of a cherry pie i know there's a wine called cherry pie and i'm not trying to compare it to that but there's but it's the cherry pie for me or pot any type of pie I, yeah. i'm going to describe it it's because there's vanilla mm-hmm. so you get a little bit of the oak mm-hmm. um or the whipped cream type of thing so there's oh, that there's that type of mm-hmm. so but it, it's not huge like you know like that that cab i had it's just like i didn't use the pie descriptor but it's just like so coats but this doesn't do that yeah and which you don't want peanut to do it anyway no. but um, but yeah, so you, you're getting some of the spiciness and, and some of the, some earthiness, but not a lot, but I like, I like how it comes out and it's super delicious and I could totally just sit back and just, mm-hmm. I want to chug it, but like it's, it goes, like it, it goes out smooth. It goes out smooth. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm trying to do. You yeah. can easily chug this and just be like, man, where, where did it go? Mm-hmm. You know? So yeah, this is really nice. I'll swallow that part. Um, <laughs> so we didn't talk about the price of the, of the rosé. Oh, yes. The price of the rosé is usually around $18. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then what is this uh, uh, going for? $55. 55 yeah. All right. Cool. Very nice. Very nice. And we have like one more we're going to cover, more. right? Yeah. Bonus. So so this is the Brno block. This is the 2016, I'm sure that's right. 2016 <laughs> Brno block. Um, this comes from our very first planting. So the vines right outside this window, right okay. window is where the grapes for this come from. Nice. So old vines, so focused. It's single block focused. So purely from this block here. Um, and I will pour you a little bit. All right, fruit. cool. And this, this I feel like is just one of the more special Pinot Noirs. This is what I will bring out when my in-laws are in town from New Jersey. Okay. Um, but they love kind of those more bolder style wines. And so this kind of checks off some of those boxes despite being a Pinot Noir. Mm-hmm. Um, I really think that it has a little more earthy than, mm-hmm. than fruit characteristics. Definitely. So, so mm-hmm. at least on the nose, it's slightly more Burgundian yeah. than, say, New World. And this is going to have a little bit longer barrel regimen, 16 months in French oak and 28% new oak. So the ageability is going to be really nice for this one, too. So it's definitely a contrasting in style here. Um, in, in, in it, it's definitely more Burgundian, even mm-hmm. on the palate. Um, it's not as new world. Um, it's still delicious. It's tartar on the cherry. Mm-hmm. Um it doesn't have as much. I mean, I know there's. Is there is, how much oak compared to the other ones? Um, the other ones. So the good thing about our bottles, all the labels have the technical information on the back. So, so you it's get a little cheat sheet, sheet on the back, right? <laughs> hey, um, I use it all the time. So they're both 16 months. Uh, the Tualatin Estate is 30 percent, and this is 28 percent. So it's about the same. Yeah, yeah, it just it feels in and so it's two percent less. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm not trying to claim I, I, I detected 2% less oak, but it did taste <laughs> wow. less oaky. Yeah. 
Now that can be a lot of reasons why it's basically the same. Mm -hmm. It just, it just, it, it could be more about the grapes, you know, coming and from this block. completely clock. different parts of land. This block out here, this is our most stressed out block that we have. Okay. So because it's opened up, the coastal range opens up to it. This just gets like pummeled with wind and rain. Yeah. So these vines just get super stressed out that just all the nutrients and everything just goes into hyperdrive to pool towards the grape. Right. So I think you get a little bit more intensity with these, uh, the fruit in here in general, whereas Tualatin Estate, because it's a little bit protected, um, we'll just, that'll have a little bit more of that more brightness to it. Okay. And I mean, tomorrow I might say the other one tastes less. Yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah, I'm not trying to like <laughs> say I'm like some super taster because I'm definitely not. Look at you. <laughs> no. But <laughs> that's one thing like in tasting group. Um, so in the Psalm world of things, in the, in the, in the quartermaster Psalm days, while we identify oak, mm -hmm. we don't really worry about like saying how much is this, that, and the other. Though in the WSET, mm -hmm. from what I understand, they want you to yeah. like say, oh, it's like 30% new oak. Yeah. And it's like, no, we just, it has, it has it or it doesn't. In there. <laughs> and like, so I'm, no. This one's really hard to spit out. <laughs> Yeah, I just kind of feel like this one has a little more. I really want to use the word rusticity, but there's there's definitely a little less of the fruit forwardness yeah. to it. Um, so this would I could totally like drink this one, but I feel I feel this is a little more serious wine. Yeah, like I don't think I would just like just chug it. I don't think I would just be like and like where to go. No, this is something I would probably like sit down and like kind of enjoy. Whether it's with food or not. Yeah, I don't even you know. think it needs food. I think no, I mean, I think Pinot, a lot of times you don't need food. Yeah. You don't really need food with Pinot. Um, not every wine requires it, but, you know, this is something that I think I would just be, like, more reflective of. Yeah. Um, and, and whereas the other one, I'm not saying that, you know, a $55 bottle of Pinot should be something that's just like a, a porch pound or anything like that, but that one goes down really smooth yeah. and really easy, right? <laughs> so, yeah, you're just like, ooh, where'd it go? Yeah. Where this Whoops. one was like, okay, after a couple hours, I finally finally finished the bottle. Yeah. So, yeah. And probably opening up over time, um, more complexities going on. So, oh, yeah. Absolutely. All these wines are awesome. And, and this is just a, a sampling of what you guys do. Yeah, I know. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> yeah. Because I've actually had some other wines. And so you brought out some really cool stuff for mm -hmm. me, which is great. Um, I think I think we're at a good spot here. Um, is there anything that we maybe didn't cover Um that we talked about or we, we saw while we we're doing the tour that we we want to chat about? Well, um, I mean, it's always, you know, circles back, I think, to, to community. And that's mm -hmm. what I love most about this company. Um, I think one of the best examples of that was when um, last fall, last harvest. Right, yeah. We had um, our, our friends and growers down in Southern Oregon about two weeks before their harvest, they had their contracts dropped. And so when we found out about that, that didn't sit well with us. Right, yeah. But you know who else it didn't sit well with? It didn't sit well with King Estate, didn't sit well with Sylvan Ridge or the Irie Vineyard. So mm -hmm. our winemaking teams together, we traveled down to Southern Oregon when this happened and we harvested all that we could down there. And together our teams collaborated without right. expectations of, of making a dime or anything. Um, and we made a Chardonnay, a Rosé of Pinot Noir, and a Pinot Noir under this Oregon Solidarity label, where all of the proceeds, they're going back to the growers down there who right. lost their contracts because they're our friends. We're not going to let our yeah. friends or neighbors out to dry. And um, that's just, it's been the spirit of the Oregon wine industry from the beginning. Right. You know, we want to see each other succeed. We want to continue to drink each other's wine because we want to drink great wine. And if our neighbors are making great wine and growing great fruit, then that's better right. for us too. Yeah. We're better together. And not to get too far into that, but there was, it was something about like, there was like a, a, a fear of smoke taint or something like that. Is that there what it was? was? A, and there was none. It yeah, ended up there was, was none. like yeah. so minimal. Like yeah. I drank all three of those wines and they're one of the most beautiful wines I've had. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's just kind of blows my mind that that even happened. <laughs> An overreaction to something that, you know, unfortunately, but you guys came through mm -hmm. and, and saved the day. Yeah. So that's, that's another great story about, you know, being part of a company that, that, that is like like this. I mean, you know, it's 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 always good to find uh, a company that um, 
has that type of philosophy. Yeah. Um, whether it's taking care of their employees, taking care of the community, or both, uh, take, being stewards of the land, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. Especially when we talk about wineries and all that. So yeah. Um, so that that's I'm glad you remember that because I know we talked yeah. about it and then I totally forgot about it. It's actually in my notes, but I was like, oh, we're good. <laughs> I, I'll remember that. That's why I put the notes in there. Um, but yeah, so Julie, thank you. Thank you, so Mark. Much. This was so much fun. I'm glad you can make it out here for it. Yeah, this has been a goal for a long time to come out here. Uh, I finally made it, and uh, I'm so glad I decided that I'm coming here instead of going elsewhere. Um, but that's a different story. I'll tell you that off camera. Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I'm so happy I made it out here because it was the next destination in my head that I was going to do. So uh, I had a great time, and I'm driving all over this place, so it's going to be great to see all the uh, stuff. And a uh, little side note, I mentioned it when we were talking. It's not just vineyards out here. There's, I mean, there was a plum orchard, right? There's orchards all over the place. Yeah. We've got a hazelnut orchard just right across the street. Yeah. Us. So that's a little bit different than like going to like Napa where it's like vineyard after vineyard yeah. after vineyard. You're going to see lots of, yeah, diversity. Is, you'll see just like farmland. Mm-hmm. You'll see orchards. You'll just see just green. You'll see vineyards. So, um, uh, there's it, there's a lot of diversity out here yeah. in Willamette. It's also not as it's also way bigger than Napa. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Well, cool. Uh, so we're gonna wrap this up. So, um, folks, thank you so much for uh, checking this out. Uh, thank you for stopping by. You should first of all, you see if you see these wines in the market, you should you should definitely get them. Uh, if this is your style of wine. You should do it. I think all these wines are excellent. I like all of them personally. Um, uh, if you come out to this area. Stop by. Um, the tasting room is absolutely gorgeous. Um, can't wait to go have some lunch up there. They have a they have a player piano, basically. Yes. Got me out of a job, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, so th- th- does it play all the time or just? Yeah, it's our hired ghost that we have that plays cool. that one. All right. <laughs> anyway, i um, so excited to do that. And um, yeah, just come out here and check it out. So um, you can click the links above to frame me up. You can click the links below uh, to find out more about Willamette Valley Vineyards. And uh, we'll see you again next time.